Good morning and thank you so much for being here at our meeting with the supervisor. I'd like to welcome Supervisor Antonovich and Brian Nibia, who is a field um, staff member. And thank you all for coming out to this important meeting. We have a lot to share, so we are going to get started. So I'm going to ask our city clerk to have the vote. Here. If we could quickly go around the room and introduce ourselves. Mike Brian McGinn. Jim Allen, County Public Library. Susan Byer, County Public Library. Christopher Dean, Temple Station. Linda Devers, Library Consultant. My daughter, Akshini, N.A. County Public Books. Tracy Haas, City of Temple City. That's Grindel on the County Public Books. Nora Garcia, Los Angeles County Department of Parks and Recreation. Mark Persico, Community Development Director. Andy Burles, Parks and Recreation Director. Brian North, Assistant to the City Manager. Anderson Bates, Supervisor, Thomas Anthony Deputy. Reed Rubino, Probation. Jose Cleveson. Tom Chavez, City Council. Fernando Vizcarra, City Council. Cindy Sternquist, Mayor. Mayor I've been a senior council member, but a lot of you do know me, and I'm also a public person in Cali County. Yeah. 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 One, two, three. <laughs> okay, we're going to move to item three, joint accomplishments, and we are going to start with Mayor Pro Tam, who will give us an update on Rosemead Kalita Sultana intersection and in yeah, just very, very quickly, last time we met, uh, we were working on the Rosemead project and there was an intersection right at the north end of our city, the south end of the county, and we were leaving there, we had a funny configuration, we wanted to do something, and uh, it worked out well, we worked with the county work with the group staff, and we got the chalice and others, and uh, the community, and it came out very well, so uh, thank you for that. The other one is the Rosemead project, obviously, if you've driven up and down the Rosemead Wall, it's all torn up at this point. And uh, a lot of thanks to the, to the county. Probably one of the big things we did when we got ready to go with our project, we met with the entire team, basically, of the county, and said, because you did the project before we did another project. And we sat down and said, okay, what are the lessons learned, and what should we do to, to do a good job? So we appreciate that. Cooperation is the same contractor. No, it's a different contractor. There were some lessons learned. Uh, we learned from the city of South Pasadena. We learned from all the members. We learned from the best support we got. So we appreciate the cooperation of the city service people who coordinated as well with us. So we just want to thank you for that. Okay, we just want to know why we did to meet with half the worst people, not because we're a public <laughs> so they actually have a lot of positive input. They said, we, we said yes, that you guys do this, this and that, and less is learned, um, certainly. So it's been a whole lot of great. Yeah, I'd And Director Burroughs will give us an update on the um, tree plantings. Uh, as, as probably all of you know, in 2011, uh, the city of Tupper City and a lot of the San Diego Valley suffered a devastating windstorm. We lost over 500 mature trees in the city. Uh, Supervisor our top bench was generous enough to make uh, funding, discretionary funding available to the cities for a tree planting grant. Uh, Tupper City did receive 70,000 uh, in, in uh, grant funds, and we have been busy this past year planting trees. We planted. Uh, over 280 of our 300 trees we plan, planned to plant uh, since March of this year, and we're working on planting the uh, uh, remainders. Uh, so we are very grateful for that planting because without it, it would be very difficult to, uh, to replace a lot of our reports. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to move to item four, current issues and priority needs. And this is on our Civic Center Master Plan and Library Needs Assessment. The library needs assessment is very dear to my heart, being an educator for over 29 years. Libraries are the utmost important, and serving on the Los Angeles County Library Commission, I know what wonderful things have been done in other cities to um, 
help them build new libraries. And so we're here today to tell you how much we'd love to partner with Valley County to have a new library. And Linda, our consultant for our library assessment, Dem Demers, mm -hmm. is here to um, give a presentation. Um, I know some of you already, um, actually Supervisor, you probably remember me from the state in New Hall and um, other places with big growth and Mark knows me from Calabasas and um, I don't live in Temple City but I've been spending a lot of time here in the last six months and I've gotten to know some really wonderful, wonderful people. Um, does everyone have a copy of the draft needs assessment? I don't know if we had 30 copies or not. I'm going to just go through some slides really quickly. And then I want to point out some things in the document that um, really jumped out at me. Uh, Giselle, which one is it? This one? Yes. Which one is it? This one? Okay. Uh, we started this process back in July. And before we met with the Library Visioning Committee, we took a good look at the demographics, who lives in Temple City. We did some benchmarking um, to compare your library to all LA County branch libraries and to um, similar libraries in the state of California. We did a five-year profile of activity at your library, which I think will um, sort of shock and amaze some of you. And we compared your existing conditions to the county library uh, planning guidelines. Then we had a wonderful committee that uh, was assembled by the, um, the mayor and the city manager, I believe, by invitation, well representing age groups. Uh, it was great to have teenagers on the committee, um, educators, chamber people, city people, parks and rec people. We did a very successful survey. We heard from almost 500 residents. And um, thank you to uh, Mr. Yu, uh, the survey was available in both English and Chinese, and we had it online as well. So that was really true because it's the first time I've done a survey in Chinese. Um, we worked with the library administration. We set some strategic goals. Uh, all of this led into a space needs analysis and a building program, which you have a draft of tonight, uh, today. And then the visioning committee did a visual preference study, and I'm going to show you a few of what they thought your library might look like. So who lives in Temple City? Uh, interesting one, we did the comparison charts of Temple City uh, residents compared to LA County, State of California, and the United States. You were never in the middle. You're always either at the very top or the very bottom of the percentages. And um, I guess for those of you who live here, it's not a surprise that you're a highly educated community. You have the highest percentage of residents with advanced degrees, more than California and the rest of the United States. Yes. And as <laughs> 10 years ago, you had the lowest percentage of residents with advanced degrees. They're working hard. Working hard. Um, <laughs> your median age is the highest of the groups. Um, it's 42 now. It was uh, 36 10 years ago, so I think that's a neat trick if you can only age four years in 10. I'd like to know how you do that. You have a high percentage of foreign-born residents, and that has climbed remarkably in the last 10 years, as well as the 62% of your population that speak a language other than English in the home. All of these factors are critical when you're planning library services. Your senior citizens tend to be among the heaviest library users, highly educated people, and serving multiple languages. What was also interesting to me was the ratio of your housing cost to your um, household income. It's one of the highest I've ever seen. In the United States, the average is about three to one. Three times your annual household income would be what you would spend on at home. In this city, it's over nine, nine times. 
um, which says to me, people are willing to spend money to live here. There must be something really good going on here. And we found out one of the really good things is the schools and the government. So let's talk about your library. 50 years old, actually 51, um, overcrowded. How many of you have used the library? How many of you have been in the library here? All right, come on, come on, more than that. All right. Uh, it's overcrowded, it has issues with noise and lighting, the, the infrastructure is aging, it's, it's well used but it's used up. This is a building that gets an enormous amount of traffic which puts a tremendous strain on the um, finishes and the infrastructure. What doesn't your library have? Doesn't have a separate children's area. We heard so much about let's have a separate children's area. This also feeds into the noise um, and to the separate functions. Group study rooms, no, no small meeting rooms, no, no browsing area. Uh, the survey respondents said you don't really have enough collections to support the school curriculum. Not much space for display and in a, a multicultural community as this, the library really should serve as a cultural and community center no quiet reading space, and the seniors, um, very high percentage of respondents on the survey from seniors said, how about a place for us to be in the library, to be quiet, to be away from the teens? It's a single story open plan building. There's nowhere to get anything uh, quiet. Then we looked at the benchmark. Um, you have 0.21 square feet per capita. The average of LA County branches is 0.35. The average in the state is about 0.6. Uh, you have half the number of meeting seats, about half the number of PCs, a little more than half the number of seats, and your collection is less than half the size of uh, LA County branches. So that's the input measures. When you look at your county planning guidelines, these are, um, Jim, correct me, they're about eight or 10 years old. Yes. And you're loosening up on them a little. They're broad guidelines. Broad, well, yeah. they're, they're guidelines, they're yes. not requirements. Exactly. But the recommendation would be 0.5 square feet per capita, which at the size of your library service area would put you at about a 28,000 square foot library. Items about 160,000 PCs per thousand, 57 meeting room seats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, What's really important is to look at these guidelines in the context of what you can reasonably afford to build and what you can reasonably, reasonably afford to operate. And the committee um, can review all of the components, the needs of the constituents. Um, we have fought, we have not, we're not coming forward today with a 28,000 square foot library. The building program that you have today is for a library that's between 20 and 21,000 square feet, which puts you just exactly at the 0.35 square feet per capita at the, at the county average. So let's look at use. This is what just shocked me. Your internet use has gone from 22,000 uses to 32,000 um, in the last five years. Your attendance has gone from 189,000 to 393,000 visits in a five-year period. So now you know why you have to be carpet so much, right? Um, 393,000 visits on the per capita basis is off the charts. Your collections are working hard, your reader seats are working hard, and your facility is really working hard. So here are some performance measures. For the state average, it's 4.4, you're at 6.4 visits. You're above on reference and you're above on program attendance. So if, if you look at the balance, the what you have is below all of the benchmarks. And the how you're using it is far above all the benchmarks, which makes the, the swing even greater. Um, I was amazed when I looked at some of these numbers. And if you do use the library, you only have, have to walk in there and see how busy and crowded it is. Susan, this is one of the busiest branches, correct? Yeah. So we did a survey, um, it was a great response. Um, more, community wants more books, more DVDs, more children's material. 
A lot of requests for computer training and computer access. We only have 12 PCs in the building now. The recommendation is for somewhere around 40. More children's programs and community information. The features that the survey respondents asked for were more quiet study, comfortable seating. Um, the seats in your library are, I think they are 50 years old. <laughs> they, are very, they are very hard. Uh, they want a computer lab, children's library. Um, <coughs> cafe came up a lot. A lot of the respondents said, we want comfortable chairs and we want refreshments nearby. So that's another conversation. Group study rooms, such as the ones seen in the image here. They want it more modern and they want this area for senior citizens. We got great comments on the survey. In the appendix, you'll note that there are um, about seven pages single space of um, individual comments. There was, there was no shortage of opinions in the community to be offered about the library. But some of the most telling to me were, this is a city that has excellent schools. We should have an excellent library. Um, and to continue this city's tradition of outstanding service, we need an outstanding library. So these were some of the images. The uh, visioning committee looked at about 240 images and they ranked them. And the top 10, interestingly, almost all of them are entrances to separate children's rooms. So you may recognize Alhambra, this is Anaheim, uh, Burbank, uh, this is in the family center at uh, Sorensen Library, study booths for parents and children, computer lab at Huntington Beach. So again, um, lots of color, more modern look, and a big focus on service to children. We talked about that a lot. Cynthia was on the committee, Vincent was on the committee. We talked about service to children and supporting and enhancing the schools. The committee also um, endorsed five strategic goals for the library, which helped us make our choices as we looked at the program. 80% said collections. We want to grow collections. We want to support early childhood literacy. Uh, we want to work with teens and adults who need to um, learn how to read expand the use of technology, and then provide a safe and uh, energy efficient welcoming facility. The essentials for the facility, a separate children's room, two out of the top three related to meeting spaces, a conference room and a community room. Apparently there are shortages of meeting rooms in the city. More computers, more books, more inter international language materials, and quiet spaces. So that's, that's the whirlwind. Um, just to fill in a few more of the blanks. Um, the issue of the schools came up pretty regularly, that you are, you are uh, distinguished schools. Um, the trends we looked at, technology is changing things. Perhaps libraries don't need to be as big as they used to be. This question comes up. Um, we talked about ebooks a lot. The ebook issue is complicated here. Um, someone asked at the visioning committee, do you have ebooks in international <coughs> languages? Ebooks are starting to replace print or supplement print. So Susan did some uh, research and there is one, right? There's one title in Chinese. There's more than that. But you have one. Yes. On Overdrive. Yes. Um, the importance of the library is the community and cultural center. Uh, you have no bookstore in Temple City, so the library is still extremely valuable as a location for recreational reading, leisure reading, book clubs. Um, I showed you what the use on the facility is, 390,000 visits a year, it takes its toll. This, is, this needs assessment um, is actually a shorter version. We did needs assessments for the Library Bond Act in 2000. Mark, you remember from the Calabasas. The state required us to do about a 200-page document. So you've all been spared. This is 17 pages. It's very tight. Um, what was most interesting to me about the demographics is the huge climb in the percentage of the population that speaks languages other than English in the home. and. Um, the change in age, 
fewer under five and fewer under 18 year old residents, but more households with under 18 year olds in the home and larger households. You have larger households in Temple City than in the rest of California, LA County, and in the United States. So um, the household income has climbed substantially, but not as substantially as the housing price. The median housing price 10 years ago was 232,000. It's 585,000 this year. It's more than doubled. The household income is only increased by 20%. So again, um, that disparity and the cost of housing relative to the um, income in um, Temple City, I think is, is um, it really speaks worlds about the city. We also notice that you have the highest um, owner-occupied housing uh, than any of the other groups. And that again says to me, homeowners tend to care more about things like libraries, public services, they're invested. The tenure of your residence is longer. People stay here. Um, just curiosity, who's lived here more than five years? More than 10 years? More than 15? OK, see so there. And more than 20? All right. <laughs> Case made. 50. More than 50. OK, so but if you look at the hard data, your residents stay here longer, and there are more homeowners. And again, these tend to be people who are more invested in the services. Um, in every single input measure, you are below all of the benchmarks, below your peer groups, below the county li all the county libraries, and below similar branches in the state. And on all of the output measures that we looked at, collection turnover and visits per capita, you were above. I don't see this too often in this kind of work. And what this says to me is that this is a community that <coughs> really cares deeply about its library and library services. Um, one of your neighbors, San Marino, built a new library, which opened about a year and a half, two years ago. And they have the highest number of visits per capita at 20. And um, I just did a study of new libraries that opened in the last 10 years in the state, mainly using the Bond Act figures. The use tri tri between triples and quadruples when a new library opens. And you can look at any project, and you can look at your projects. From the day they last closed in the old building to the day they opened in the new building, the use is three to four times as much. So if your visits per capita are six point something now, they will be at 25 in a new building, which is beyond what even San Marino is seeing right now. Um, so um, we better make it big enough, and we better make it durable <laughs> and easily maintained. Um, anyway, there's a lot more information in here, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to leave off the needs assessment for the moment. What, what um, we looked at at the committee level is a library of approximately 21,000 square feet. The collections would go from 60,000 to 100,000, media from 8,000 to 22,000. We would have up to 150 reader seats. We'd have group study rooms, a separate children's area, a story time area, a quiet reading room, which might be where the senior citizens would like to go, and maybe we'll put that on the other end of the building from where the children's library is. Um, we talk about it being environmentally responsible. Um, as we get further on in the planning, we look at issues like security, sight lines. The county library will weigh in, and the county public works will weigh in very heavily on the technical details. Um, a sustainable building, um, technology-rich, free. Well, you have free Wi-Fi now. Uh, people ask for more bandwidth, no matter how much have they want more. You want to be able to serve 200 laptops at the same time easily. High-end meeting rooms, um, but flexible too. Um, and one of the images that we looked at was shelving on wheels. So maybe we don't have as much open space. Maybe you just move things out of the way. Um, the, the visioning committee did some field work and went around and looked at some new libraries 
Diamond Bar just opened in New Branch last year. Last year? Yeah. yeah. They built up 0.3 square feet per capita, and it was a commercial building that they renovated to approximately 20,000 square feet. It's really quite a nice project. Chino Hills opened a new public library recently. San yeah. Marino's two years ago. Um, the county library has done some really beautiful work uh, with the new libraries. Um, we're in the middle of planning a new, uh, new expanded library for Castaic, where the population really has grown tremendously. Um, I think it's very, it's, it's a very exciting time for you. The possibilities are unlimited. Um, I think we made some good choices, not to make it too big, not to make it too small, just the right size. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. I hope that you all will take a look at this draft document and um, get back to us. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to ask um, House Member and if you could just give a, a brief um, tie-in with the uh, brief proposal. No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, on behalf of all the residents, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Tanovich uh, for your support of our, of our library. This is one key piece of building, as you can, as Linda's uh, presentation shows, this is such a popular place. I mean, my two kids literally grew up in a the library. They have read all the kids' books they, that you have in, in the library. Um, as we all know that um, the, um, the state had uh, disbanded to the, our um, community redevelopment um, uh, organization, so there's really no good way for any uh, <coughs> municipality to finance any, any major buildings. So our city has been turned to creative ways such as the P3, which is the private public partnership. And we talked to you before in the last couple meetings we had with you, and then you have pointed us to work pointed us to work with the library folks, and they've been more than uh, helpful in, in, in working with us and in, in, in through this process. Um, but before I go on, I also want to introduce our school board member, uh, Temple City Unified School District School Board member, Ken Nolenberg. And then, because, you know, the three key uh, players in, in, in the Civic Center is the LA County, um, the Temple City Unified School District, and our city. Uh, we're exploring the possibility of all three entities working together. And I think we've witnessed in the past, the last few years, so many projects that have been done by state, county, LAUSD, uh, and, and the local cities. So we're really looking for a possibility that we may explore that possibility of working together again. Um, as you well know, Temple City is what is fully built out, so there's really no good way to, to, to develop anything without impacting all our surrounding buildings. We're really looking forward to using this as, as an opportunity, not just to improve, provide better library services, better, better city services, better um, school services. We're also looking at a way to revitalize the east end of our city. Um, uh, we want the, the um, all three entities working to take it together, we can have a better uh, civic center that would be, that will last for the next 20, 50 years. Um, very quickly, I want to just go over some of the concept that we have explored. Uh, obviously, it is just a concept, and we're looking to see what that would do, what that means in terms of services, what that means in terms of financing, what that means in terms of the overall urban design. So I just want to cover this very quickly. Um, obviously, this would be where the library is today, and this is where the, the city hall is today, and then the Temple City Unified School District, the school district headquarters building is actually up on the other side of Las Tunas. So, this concept explores the possibility of co-locating all three facilities together, be sustainable. If, instead of one entity provides all buildings, all facilities, and serving only part of the time, you know, for example, a chamber, council chamber, a boardroom, uh, conference room use only maybe one night in two weeks, one night every week. We're exploring the possibility of all three entities uh, being very sustainable and using the facility together and also helping each other out. I mean, we have a great park that we're going to maintain here. Um, we're thinking of going up. Well, first of all, 
we thought that um, we, we keep the park here and we have an underground parking um, that will serve all three entities because we are busy at different times. For example, the library is busy during the day and then the city hall and uh, you know, our, our council meetings are in night. So, um, and, we, um, and we also think of moving, perhaps moving back the city hall building act and, and, and create and have a coffee terrace and open space here that will bring the park to the street. Um, we think of perhaps a retail store here on the first floor, such as Starbucks or something like that. Um, and then we want to locate the library on the first floor because we know the most efficient library design is one story, easy surveillance, easy access, easy control. And then you are front and center, the, the library folks can use the park as well as take advantage of the uh, coffee shop. Uh, here we have the community center that would again will be John use, jointly used. Um, because uh, really don't, besides our Life of Park uh, Community Center, there really is not a big community space on this side of town. Uh, we also think of a boardroom, joint uh, council chamber, uh, and then going upstairs on the second floor, uh, this is City Hall on top of the library. Uh, you have a similar arrangement in some of your libraries right now and been a very successful uh, model. Uh, here, over here is the Temple City Unified School, School District Headquarter. And obviously this gives us the opportunity not only to join news, we give us the ability to look at perhaps what the uh, headquarter building might be used for in the future and it's really a key piece of um, urban redevelopment that the city is looking at. And we really would like to continue working with the county exploring different possibilities of, um, of taking this to the next level. All right, thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Are there any questions for either Linda or Council Member? I'm going to work with you to be a shelter for some college. And I talked as well. One of the suggestions I made that never went anywhere <coughs> When they passed the uh, state education fund, is that they would have legislation take half a percent, half of one percent, one percent, and have that money go to library construction. Because I mean, teachers you can impose that. So it didn't, it didn't see the light of day. But I was trying to tell them that it helps the teachers if they have a good library. Because some of the schools are closing the library. We need to have libraries, and this is a vital component of the education system. Mm -hmm. Yes, but they didn't. Again, they're not always right as we know. They're wrong at times. So you, you, have a, you have a source of funding that can be applied so wide, and it's a source of allow cities oh. and communities to do Bridge. And I agree that opinions are not always right. Um, there are many times that my school district union uh, argued on behalf of the greater good and also the teachers that I knew were saying, where are they doing? So I'm not, I agree. But I'm happy to hear that you're more to the we do have one that's two story and The one in Castell, private mall in the as well. So looking at some type of public private partnerships, which will be near this of how we can make this work. I 
Thank you. I think sort of the mindset of this council as we approach this, realizing that you know, the day of individual groups doing their own thing and stand alone, there's not enough time. In our city, there's not enough space. So, you know, as we were pursuing this, combining the three of them, using some joint stuff, you know, common restrooms, or whatever the case may be, to bring that cost down so that we can do it. So, you know, just as we did on the Rosebeam project, Forward, how do you, how do you just so, we appreciate your cooperation and your staff. Linda, thank you for a phenomenal job on that analysis. Thank you so much. Thank you. We move to item 4B focused improvements in code enforcement along Rosemary Boulevard. And Council Member, um, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Bloom will give us a very brief. Uh, this is just the, the, those of our, our city, the, sort of the, the western side of the city, the parts unappropriated area for, for parking lot, for parts of it, uh, basically the road even wash on the west side of the north of Rosemary Boulevard. And as we're improving Rosemary Boulevard, it's starting to pretty nice. The, the properties just adjacent to Rosemary Boulevard part of the county area. I'll be, I'll be nice to look at less than nice. And they really need to move you know, the county, I think, to look at the code enforcement issues there. Uh, we're pre moving some of the streets. There's some street work that may need to be done there. And, uh, there's another item on here, a piece of big, big property along there. And, uh, I think we're, we're looking forward to uh, possibly working with the county to improve that. So we just don't have to put the stuff in our city that's right next to just sort of drops off the map. And so we really need your support in doing some of that stuff. So I'm not I think everybody knows what that is. Just like we were talking about it. Well, to follow on just for a bit. I know it's Carl. Last time I worked together for a couple of years, 20 years. Yeah. Councilman. <laughs> I mean, Palisburg, Rancho Palisburg, that's what I mean. Um, uh, now, on Monday, I sent the, uh, the rehab, the building safety rehab people out there to kind of take a look at, a look at the area. And they identified. I kind of drove by that this morning, too. I kind of thought might, this might be a picture for uh, this, this property. Um, but I sent them out there, and they're going to, they saw some things they want to work on and that they need to work on. They're going to work with public health to try and clean up some of these areas. They kind of mentioned they have a hard time. You know, making uh, you know, making properties and do paint and do aesthetic, more aesthetic treatments uh, outside the you know, outside the, the, the realm of what the building code and, and the public health code allows. So, but they are going to work on some things to try and uh, you know, try and improve that, uh, that situation. Uh, I understand what you're meaning that you know all the beautification that the city's doing. And the county has done the same thing uh, in North, so. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, part of our philosophy in upgrading Rosemary Boulevard, you, know, you, you can either get the properties on each side to approve and sort of force the improvement of the public you know, infrastructure. And we took it the opposite direction. We said, let's improve what we've got first, and, and hopefully then that starts spreading out to the rest of the community. So that's the approach we're taking. It's a Sunday that the program area is right next door. And we need to work together to fully accomplish, I think, what we're trying to do. It sounds like the respective staffs kind of maybe need to get together and maybe more detail what you all want or if you envision there. Maybe there's the things that we can do to progress that. Yeah, I think you need your staff work with Mark. So, um, sure, certainly. Thank you so much for your efforts. We move to item 4C, Sheriff Department's response times and develop to develop a plan that achieves faster response times to Temple City from Temple Station and Community Development Director Mark Persico. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, we are, um, obviously everybody is very concerned about public safety and we, we think the Sheriff's Department is, is doing a good job. What we're looking for really is just um, additional improvement. What we have seen is um, 
some, some decline in response times, and what we're looking at is uh, parity with some of the adjacent cities. I'm not sure of the, the source of all of the uh, statistics that are here on the screen, so I'm, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll say I'm uh, skeptical of the San Gabriel response times. Um, but we, we would look, like to look at parity with um, certainly Arcadia, I think would be a good model. Uh, maybe Alhambra would be a good model. Those cities should have their own police force. Um, that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, I, there's really not much more to say on that yeah, topic at this time. Okay. Any, any questions? Any comments? Um, well, thank you very much. And thank you, um, Mr. Tomich, Mr. Stanquist, City Council Mr. Uh, please note, Sheriff Parker, the Sheriff's Department, myself, completely dedicated to the right of <coughs> to uh, tell the city is all our, our contracts in the corporate areas. Um, I'm not quite sure the source of those response times either. I'd be very interested in seeing the source documents to support those. Uh, we've had some financial challenges as a department, uh, some staffing uh, challenges. We have a uh, long-term plan to fix some of our vacancies that will help dramatically increase our, uh, well, I can't say dramatically, but it will obviously increase our response times. Um, I do know the standards that we've set forth, both from the department uh, standard that I've set forth within the Temple City itself, which are even uh, more restrictive than the time standards allowed by the department, are uh, quite stringent, and uh, we presently beat both those standards on that report. Uh, that doesn't mean we rest on our laurels at all. We always strive to provide the best service. We think we do a great job now, we can do a better job tomorrow, and we're fully committed to doing that. So, I look forward to working with the park and the city council. Build plans for the new government's cost of that. No, they're going to truly be dedicated to the rest of the service we can. And Captain Neal, Sheriff, staff can get the source of those numbers for you. Please, please, please. So you can work with them. Thank you. Item 4D Public Safety Realignment. To find a strategy <coughs> that addresses the early release of inmates from state prisons and its impact to Temple City, and I know Mayor Pro Tem Bloom asked for this to be on the agenda. Yeah, we all, we all know the realignment that's taken place with the, with the prisoners and stuff like that. And, and the impact, I think we're starting to see the impact fairly rapidly in the city. Burglaries that are, that are going out in the group. We had a council meeting last night. Before the meeting, I had three or four people come up to me and said, Are you aware about the burglaries in this house? And to meet with the sheriff's department, and you know, most of the feedback is those are the people that the, the drug addicts that need to keep their habits going, they're being released back into the community. And the question is, you know, how do we how do we address those, whether it's through probation? Some of the feedback we're getting is, you know, some of these people commit it, they get hauled in, they're back on the streets very quickly, and, you know, they're back in the town here, and you know, they look at this city and they say, hey, there's some nice places here that we can you know, get, get whatever we need to, to keep our habits going. So we just want to bring it up, we know it's a challenge, the whole state's dealing with it, we understand, you know, justice, you know, the nation department, the sheriff, we're all working on it, but, I just wanted to reinforce why I know you're very strong in this area. But, uh, it is a concern. We're a safe city. We pride ourselves to be a safe, safe city. I think our values and everything in this city are there. And when we just see this, I don't know what to call it, but we just see this wave coming that's just driving in the opposite direction. And, uh, I just encourage everybody to do all that we can. And, uh, I know there's a strain on resources, but and there's some money coming back from the state to address these issues. And I just want to encourage everybody that it's a, it's a concern to us. We're hearing from our citizens. And, you know, we, we get reports regularly from the sheriff and just watch what's taking place here in the And this is where the, uh, the state legislators seem to repeal that. Because, uh, and we be very hand to go into some details, but of those individuals who have been placed from state to county probation, it's over 20,000. More than 21,000 have been rearrested. Some of them 
higher than, I mean, more than one address, that's why the number is higher than the address of those. That's 20,000. And of those that have been sent to county jail instead of the state penitentiary, we have a large number that have been sentenced from eight years to 42 years in the county jail, which were not housed to provide those type of services. And I talked about how the county were not either or the other 57 counties. So just as the state was sued on their health, the state was giving up $18,000 plus for health care for inmates. And they were sued. That's more than most people have in their private insurance. The counties don't have those type of funds. The hospitals already have the capacity to have a vacancy in their hospitals. So it's a bad proposition. It doesn't work. The governor could contract out of state and state beds, which he has. And he's not giving us full funding for the beds that we are providing. It's much less. So we are taking, we'll be taking money from other general funds, sheriff and others, to support this problem. But we were in Canada. We're going to go into more detail. Thank you. I just want to touch briefly on the issue of the Supreme Court
no prior to realignment, if an individual were to violate supervision, they could go uh, back to custody for up to a year uh, because they had a uh, parole uh, tail, if you will. Uh, we have some individuals that, uh, when they are convicted on uh, new offenses uh, now, uh, under 1178, will uh, do their straight time. There is no tail, there's no uh, supervision uh, opportunity for the probation department to determine whether or not they have been rehabilitated, if you will. Uh, for those individuals that are on uh, public safety uh, realignment or PRCS, uh, if they violate, uh, there are some tools in our toolbox. We have flash uh, incarceration, uh, which again, for the sophisticated uh, uh, criminal, uh, means absolutely nothing. It's, it, you can uh, put them in custody for up to uh, 10 days uh, if they have uh, some sort of violation. If we send them back, uh, on a uh, revocation, uh, each revocation could uh, be 180 days again because of the good time, work time, which is 90 days. Then when you consider uh, the percentage time that they serve, even if they uh, commit a violation, they're staying in custody uh, a very short period of time. So when they do these calculations, they will determine whether or not uh, uh, committing a, an offense or continuing their criminal enterprise uh, is worth it and many of them are, are, are deeming that yes it is worth it because the time that uh, uh, we're going to spend uh, in custody is not enough to serve uh, as a uh, deterrent. And just to kind of uh, give you uh, just some of the numbers, we have just um, October represented our second year of public safety uh, realignment, as many of you know, uh, it, it, it uh, became effective October 2011. <clears throat> Over that two-year period of time, um, the uh, probation department or LA County has processed over 21,000 individuals uh, from the uh, state. Uh, of those uh, 21,000, there's still a number of them that have not yet been uh, released, but over 18,000 of them have been released. Some have been released uh, to the custody of federal uh, federal custody because of deportation holds and, and to other jurisdictions for various uh, holds. I don't know. But uh, about 18,000 of them have actually been released to the custody uh, of the uh, county of Los Angeles. <coughs> Over that period of time, uh, when first, when, uh, in October of 2011, we were uh, receiving about uh, 1,000 individuals a month, 900 to 1,000 individuals a month. That has since uh, tapered off to about four to 500 uh, a month. And we are now, as, as many of you know, uh, if an individual uh, completes one year of supervision without a custodial sanction, we can terminate uh, those. And we must, uh, as a matter of law, terminate those individuals from uh, supervision. So we are receiving about four to 500. We're terminating about uh, four to 500 uh, for various reasons. So our population is stabilized at about uh, 8,200 uh, individuals. Uh, if you, to put that in uh, uh, perspective for uh, your area, uh, Temple City, uh, as of November, uh, November the uh, 4th, uh, has nine uh, PSDs, Arcadia, nine, El Monte, 25, those being 20, uh, San Gabriel uh, 20, so there are uh, 83 uh, PSPs uh, in and about the uh, uh, Temple City uh, area. Uh, as the supervisor uh, indicated, uh, we do have in the uh, recidivism rate, if you just uh, are counting uh, uh, new arrests, uh, not necessarily convictions. Uh, overall, we're at about a 32% uh, recidivism uh, rate, being and they've sustained at least one new arrest. Uh, we use flash incarceration at the rate of about uh, 1,000 uh, incidents of flash incarceration uh, a month. Again, that uh, is our ability. Uh, without uh, judicial intervention, we can just simply uh, return it and we can test it for up to uh, 10 days for uh, a violation. And we're using those for uh, individuals that uh, are not reporting, individuals that uh, are continuing to use uh, substances that they have a dirty test or something to that effect, not going to uh, counseling, be it mental health counseling, substance abuse counseling, uh, whatever the uh, violation might be. Now, if there's an egregious 
uh, a violation and it would get egregious becomes relative on the, on the scale of, of, of uh, what these individuals are, are, are doing. But uh, if, if there's a very egregious uh, event that uh, uh, really impacts public safety, uh, we will move towards uh, revocation as opposed to the use of multiple flash uh, incarceration. Uh, we've done a number of things to try to address uh, ongoing criminal activities uh, in, the, in, in your uh, communities. Uh, one, we are working with uh, local law enforcement to develop uh, uh, community or regional uh, policing teams, and we developed those teams uh, close to a year ago, and there is a team that's operative uh, in your area, and that's where uh, the uh, local law enforcement agencies come together. We co-locate a probation officer with these teams, and they are looking to address uh, those individuals that are continuing uh, their involvement in criminal activity. Uh, we try to target those individuals that are most likely to reoffend, uh, and uh, we are utilizing uh, suppression activities and other uh, activities to ensure that those individuals are returned to custody as quickly uh, as we could possibly get them there. We have a number of other work groups that have been formed as a result of public safety realignment, uh, treatment work groups, uh, law enforcement uh, work groups, the legal work group, community advisory uh, committees. And all of these committees are looking at the various aspects of public safety realignment with a view towards uh, even though it was thrust to the public, uh, even though it's something that uh, has been very problematic, it is here. So we have to uh, try to figure out how can we uh, work together to ensure that uh, we do the best we can uh, to work with individuals who are trying to make the most of realignment, but at the same time deal with those individuals that uh, are going to be predatory and they will continue to still uh, apply their criminal uh, enterprise. Um, a few things that have uh, transpired uh, subsequent to uh, the October rollout of realignment, uh, there was, uh, there's still a question of what's going to happen with uh, the uh, 10,000 inmates uh, that uh, the state has been ordered uh, to address. Uh, again, there's still, still 10,000 individuals over the 137 percent to which they were to reduce their uh, population. Uh, that is still an unknown. Uh, the worst case scenario is that we could get uh, an additional 100, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1,500 to 3,000 individuals on top of the uh, number of individuals that uh, we have currently uh, received. And also, uh, under resentencing, uh, we received about 100 uh, additional uh, individuals that uh, were the recipients of having their uh, uh, sentence reviewed uh, as a result of the three strikes uh, law. Um, so that's a general uh, overview. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to entertain those. Oh, uh, we are still struggling to get, uh, we, we're at about uh, maybe 65 to 70 percent uh, of our staffing uh, capacity. Uh, we receive uh, 470 uh, new items, 363 of which are sworn staff. Uh, we are currently uh, at about 65 to 70 percent uh, of that staffing. One of the challenges that we have in terms of getting uh, people on board, uh, the first way that we uh, attempt to fulfill, fulfill our staffing is to allow for promotion opportunities, individuals that are within the department promoting uh, the deputy probation officer to positions. We have identified individuals to come over to the 8109 program, but most of those individuals are in our institutions. Uh, as you know, the Department of Justice uh, is currently in our institutions, and we are at the tail end of complying with the uh, Department of Justice Settlement Agreement, and one of which uh, is staffing in our camp. So if we allow a mass exodus of individuals from camps to uh, the field positions, then we would compromise the gains that we've made with the Department. It's a it's a, yeah, it's a sort of a vicious cycle, but uh, we're getting there. We anticipate, uh, I know that uh, December 1 is the, the date that uh, the chief committed to having 445 and 470 uh, on board. Uh, we're probably um, looking at uh, the middle of next year before we are actually in a better place uh, uh, to do.
do what we need to do. And one of the reasons that that is very critical is because we are creating specialized uh, caseloads to uh, reduce, uh, we want uh, sex offender caseloads, uh, uh, homeless caseloads, uh, and uh, caseloads uh, for the uh, mentally ill because they are causing us a, a, a quite a bit of uh, activity in the community. And we're trying to reduce those caseloads to a size of 20 to 1. In order to do that, we need to get these people released to us. Uh, any other uh, questions? For the non-county people, uh, items are budgeted positions. I am going to ask just for the sake of time, how are you doing? Okay. Okay, just, just to follow up, we're, we're not criticizing the county. I think mean, it's a big problem. We're all, we're all trying to deal with it. Our council and our city has been very proactive. We, we have a graffiti uh, contractor on board who's constantly working on the movement of graffiti. We're working with the sheriff. We develop, thanks to the, the sheriff and have our staff, we work a very aggressive neighborhood watch program. Uh, we, we come to the entire city. This last year we had it divided into 12, 12 zones, so to speak. So we, have, we have one meeting per month, so each of the zones gets covered every year and we're getting between 50 and 80 people there talking about neighborhood watch, how to prevent, how to, you know, mm -hmm. all the good stuff from a proactive standpoint. So yeah, that's why we need to look at both ends and then you're, you're doing all this. So we need to work as a team. I guess maybe one of the things we could ask is if there's legislation that, that, that's coming up that, that needs support, uh, I'll admit I'm not following this stuff all the time. So if somebody on the staff we have, a, we have a laundry list of proposals to amend AD 109 and alternative to repeal. Uh, there's no will in Sacramento to modify it, however. Well, the will starts so far. with, with I mean, we're meeting with state legislators also. I mean, the, the will starts at the, at the, right. at the grassroots, I and mean, that's where it's got to come. I mean, that's why we appreciate you coming here and you hearing what our concerns are. But we also would appreciate that if the no legislation uh, you know, let the city manager know what the positions are. Well, there, it's not why you do legislation for the next year. So, I'm hoping that I'll be able to support the facility for the mentally disordered sex offender. Yeah, mentally disordered. And they would be asked to go. And we were supporting the chief sanctuary as a chief of police for the county council. Until they can make it a crime, it's not a priority. It's a sad commentary because the statistics to are alarming as to the impact of the It's a serious issue. We've often said that you know, they react to the <coughs> wolf is at the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the, the, uh, <coughs> we're only going to have the, the low risk. 61% are high risk or very high risk. One and a half percent are only locals. So, if he was selling a consumer product, he'd be in court for uh, <laughs> selling falsehoods. And to just to highlight what Supervisor just uh, communicated, what the state did is release the individuals that are most likely to be uh, You know, we. Uh, term them as uh, non-serious, non-violent, non-sexual, and, and that's again a misnomer. I think two years into it, everybody knows that that's not the case. When they talk about non-serious, non-violent, uh, non-sexual, there are two sections of the penal code that define, define serious and violent uh, felonies. 67.5, 1192 of the penal code uh, provides the legal definition for serious and violent. Uh, the individuals that are released to us uh, the only criteria is the last offense for which they went to state prison. So they may have gone to state prison on a petty theft with a prior or a, uh, a drug-related offense or some non-serious offense. But when you look at the totality of their criminal history, they have uh, those serious and violent uh, offenses uh, by definition of law. So when you look at the population, again, that are your drug users, that are your, uh, those that are committing the property crimes, those that are your uh, are perpetual offenders, is the population that was uh, released 
uh, to the counties uh, for supervision. So when you talk about uh, um, seeing increases, uh, and, and there's still research that needs to be done to determine the correlation between uh, the released population and the increase in crime, but there has been an acknowledgement that those individuals that are released are the ones who are most likely to continue. Well, we appreciate uh, the work you do in your profession with uh, the captain and We truly appreciate it. And as a city without support from you people, it really, really good. Really, really. so, so thank you for that. For our message is we do need to keep working together. And this is a serious issue. It's becoming more of an issue in our city here. So we want to stand Thank you. And I think this council has taken some proactive steps with meeting with our fellow sheriffs department and our team uh, monthly and they are I know aggressively out there making sure that our city stays safe and our residents so I want to thank you for that captain also. We're going to move to item 5A our parks and open master plan and just as our results from our library um, assessment survey came back to us we also have um, similar needs with our parks and open space we are very much an underserved community in relationship to the uh, per capita and open space so council member Viscara is going to give you a briefing on this yeah we have a, a um, city uh, subcommittee devoted to, to our parks and open space. In fact, both of these items kind of fit together because they're quality of life uh, things and they're not real serious like the probation problems. These are these are things that kind of make folks happy and make for, for uh, a good community. And the one thing we've been aware of for a long time is that we're landlocked. Uh, we have one large park, we have one small park, and beyond that, not too much more. So we've been working with a consultant to come up with ideas, and and I guess I'm saying that we we, we want the county to, to, to keep us in mind, keep us on the radar as we evolve, and there are some things we want to do. The consultants come up with some, some ideas about what we can do, and there are things like purchase property, take the property down, build a park. Uh, that gets real pricey very quickly. And, um, but some unique ideas too. We have, how many water companies? Five in the city? Uh, they all have pumps on, on property within the city. And they have these huge parcels with little tiny house of some sort that I guess has their pumping equipment. And that land is just going to waste there, so we're, we're going to engage in contact with them and see if they'll cooperate with us to have pocket parks. And, and uh, a consultant found out that there are other cities that have done this successfully. We have to build some kind of fencing wall or something to protect their equipment, but I think we could do it. Uh, we could do public gardens. There's a lot of ideas that they're coming up with, and so we'd like you to, to keep us in mind as we go along. We'll probably be knocking on your door and asking if you can help us. Um, and um, the other thing I'm really interested in, and uh, the council is also, is uh, the walking and biking trails along the Eaton Wash. Now, talking earlier to some of the staff, but I know you guys have tried to, to uh, get some grant money, and it's, it's not that easy. But we have some of the essential elements here, I think. We have the wash, we have the property on either side, we have the will. We'd like to see something happen. Um, it's a perfect opportunity. We can't have the parts we want, but something like this would really serve our purposes in helping people to get out. We're putting bike lanes throughout the city. Uh, that would be that could be an extension of that. So if you would keep this in mind, we we uh, that's the place we want to go very badly. And we've located a couple of parcels that are adjacent to that to the Eaton Wash there where we could do pocket parks for people to stop off and the, there's there's one example, uh, Rosemead and Olive also, we've identified a, a place, that's private property which we could you know, potentially purchase and do a park. So that, that's a future opportunity. 
Now, the other one that I'm very excited about is our public arts program. Uh, about three years ago, one of our residents and, uh, and I have been talking, and I'm not an arts person, he is, and he, um, he was saying, why can't we do something about our, our park? There's nothing there that speaks to the history of the park. So he came up with the idea of putting up a uh, bust of Walter Temple, who's the fellow that developed the city. And um, subsequently, he and, and uh, uh, Carl Blum met, and, and they evolved uh, the idea of having a public arts committee. So that was established. Uh, Council member Chavez and I were, were, were on that committee and we worked with those folks for about two years. Um, and we did things like established a, a mural on, on the library there. We got the bust of Walter Temple on the corner over here with a very nice wall. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful and some other things. And um, that committee morphed into what is now our Public Arts Commission that we put together earlier this year in, uh, in June, I think it was, right? There was. And, and so we now have a Public Arts Commission that is involved in it. And we have seven folks that, that are very excited about what's happening uh, with Public Art in the City. The, the uh, development of Roseby Boulevard push things ahead even more because there are a lot of opportunities for public art there and we're, how much money are we putting in the public art? Um, those people, where are we? A quarter of a minute. So we, we have a lot of projects that are going on on Roseby Boulevard and, and, and uh, there are going to be mosaics, be rest spots, and you're going to see some really neat things happening at the entrance to the city. So as you can tell, I'm kind of excited about it. That's really like it. <coughs> the development that was going in the center. The one on the corner over here. You want to speak to that? Oh, project. Exactly. I think you're talking about the gateway project, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, on the corner of Rosemead and Lost. Rosemead. Construction's underway. I know. It's a pretty By 2015. 15. Yeah. 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 trails in back of their yard. So I think this is 
I keep smiling the entire time because if you have this community movement that really wants these trails, I think that is a difficult part. I think the easy part is getting us together and, and starting um, to do the work. So I look forward to working uh, with uh, Kathy and we'll sit up a subsequent meeting. I have a question. A few years ago, sure. there was um, some movement. Uh, Amigos de los Rios? Yeah, yes. regarding those, and that just died away. I guess. It, it hasn't exactly died, um, and so I think we can resurrect that. Um, we are currently, the county is currently working with Amigos de los Rios to do a uh, programmatic EIR of the Emerald Necklace um, that's focused um, in a particular area, and we're working very closely with the city of Arcadia, the city of Al Monte and regarding some trail development there, more focused around closing the loop um, on the Emerald Necklace along the San Gabriel River and the Rojano River. So uh, the connection of Eaton Wash is, I think, a, an excellent opportunity. The COG, the COG is very involved. Yes, yes, we've made uh, presentations to the COG. And so there's been some concerted effort in that area, but I think it's a great opportunity now that uh, Supervisor Antonovich has given us uh, additional staffing support just to focus on the 5th District. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity. I, I recall attending some of those workshops and the biggest complaint was from the people who belong those workshops. That's exactly it. They do not want it in their backyard. That is the biggest constraint. We, we've done a couple uh, where we've done some short stretches. Um, I tell you, um, and that's the biggest hurdle that you have. <clears throat> maybe one or two strong advocates, but the remainder, um, we, we been more success, successful in our urban, um, we have, we just did a, a one in Compton, one of those, one of the most difficult communities, and it's improved safety because we have, you know, we have sheriff who's our, we have a specific uh, uh, law enforcement working with our parks and on our trails. We have mounted patrol. We have community walking groups now that have developed as a part of. You just don't build it. You just will also have to develop the programming the lighting um, and all the amenities that really make it uh, very safe. So oh, it's, really, improved. So that's, it's that's really, really improved safety in, in one of the toughest areas. So I feel like it can work there, and it does work everywhere else. It's just an example. So that's the strategy to try to assure them that there are measures being taken that will that, take care of those safety. Measures. Absolutely. We just don't just say, let's open up a trail and, and have fun. It's, we really focus on the, you know, the design elements and make it safe. Um, working closely with law enforcement, working closely with um, the local park park departments to ensure that there's programming, local community as well to create these walking um, clubs. We also have a very strong um, bike coalition in the San Diego Valley that are very interested in, and they provide a lot of the monitoring, a lot of the programming along along the river. So I think this is really exciting. The fact that um, there's a concerted effort from the community to open up some of these spaces that can can be used for walking and biking. And and it, I just have to say that um, it, we'd have to work very closely in partnership with the Flood Control District to be able to do that. If I may add also to take the lead from what you said about the community involved, uh, Mr. Antonovich uh, provided funds to approve Pamela Park and that we are going to the year for Pamela Park is horrific park, gang infested. Uh, so we got the office for money in that park, revitalize the park. And the true key to that was the revitalization, like, like these here walkways, but to also get the community involvement because the gang members don't go there now. You can go there almost any time, day or night, and it's uh, families, they're using it, they utilize it. So the key component of that is to get the community to buy into to utilize it. Because the gang members aren't going to go, the crooks aren't going to go, there's walking groups up going down that pathway along the river that they won't be. Where, where is that? Pamela Park. Pamela Park. It's uh, up in the Monroe Valley Community Ward area, just below the 210 freeway, if, uh, just east of California Avenue. Mm -hmm. You go up Myrtle, California River. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous revitalization. It's really turned that whole neighborhood around. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes. Just Ken? under the public comments, just like to thank the cooperation between the city and the sheriff's department for the for the bomb threats that we had at the, at Longden and the high school and the response uh, uh, how well they worked together to support uh, the the problems at those two schools. Thank you. Anything else? All right. 
Supervisor, thank you again so much. Um, we look forward to all these exciting partnerships with the county, and thank you all for participating. Thank you.